Our next speaker is Hilliard Hicks, the third. So some students get here and they need a little nudge when it comes to getting out and meeting people and connecting with folks. And we actually do a how to network like a pro workshop for students to achieve just that. But for Hilliard, Hilly, that is not the case. In fact, he came to this symposium last year, stayed for the entire thing, start to finish, came to Scripps Day. I think bef by the time we started the program, you had met 50% of the people at Scripps already. <laughs> Um, Hilliard came here from the Peace Corps in South Africa, and after the program, he'll be a Peace Corps response volunteer in the Philippines as the Aquatic Resource Management Specialist, where he'll be designing MPAs, ma doing mangrove conservation, and uh, underwater assessments. He'll also be doing a month-long Cal Coffee cruise this summer on the RV Ruben Lasker. And I'm really gonna miss his teeny tiny cups of espresso. <laughs> The title of Hilliard's project today is Mangroves, a Blue Carbon Project, Communicating Restorative Benefits of Mangrove, Eco Mangrove Ecosystems in Rural KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. Thank you, thank you Samantha, for, for that lovely introduction. And thank you all for coming today and making it to our, our final few presentations. Uh, throughout these presentations, we've actually learned how ecosystems are changing due to anthropogenic influences, uh, human-caused influences. And um, we've also learned different ways to sort of mitigate against these effects as well. And so the basis of my project was to communicate uh, in my old village in South Africa sort of why it's important to preserve mangrove ecosystems. Because marginalized populations uh, are at risk the most. You know, people who, who live close to the shore and who live along, along the coast, like I said, they're very, very at risk of things like sea level rise and inundation. So the degradations of mangroves have been existing, th increasing throughout the world, and right now we're losing around 4.5% annually, which is a lot considering that these mangrove ecosystems account for maybe half a percent of the coastal, the coastal zone. And uh, when I was in South Africa, I learned of the word izinkaha, which is, uh, it stands for mangrove in Zulu. And when I would ask people, whether you know they cared about mangroves, they'd say, "Ah, anginanda ba maelango izinkaya," which roughly translates to, "I don't care about mangroves. They're they're just <laughs> <laughs> they're just trees." <laughs> and so the basis of my project was to really to really go in and say there is a value to these mangroves. So this project dates back to 2014 to 2017 or 2016 when I served in South Africa. And uh, for all of you who don't know where South Africa is, it's at the bottom of Africa. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was in a, a small little village on the northeastern corner just below Mozambique. And I would, you know, we, we sat on these three lakes and I would go out and visit these lakes frequently uh, for things like fishing, swimming, trying to avoid hippopotamus and croc crocodiles, and just having a good time on these lakes. And I knew that mangroves existed, but I didn't necessarily know the extent of which they're being cut down. And I chose Manguzi because it's, it's a naturally beautiful place if you ever have a chance to, to make it out there. And the people who live there, the, the Zulu people, they, they appreciated it, but they still cut down the mangrove forests. They're, there, was, there was a lot of using it for, for things such as fish crawls, uh, which is a, like, sort of like a corral for fish or for like thatch roofs. And so when I went over there, um, I was able to talk to everybody about like why, why it's important to keep them around. So I, I just want to show you a quick little video on the izinkaha, I mean mangroves, that uh, were existed around the lake.
Mwamfunishe Kububina Mwamfunishe Ukwabule chibote Mwamfunishe Kububina Lesae Ni mwe mwe katatae Ni mwe katatae Ndi mwana wenu Mwande tele Kubu nonshi Mwande tele Ukwa fule fisuma Mwande tele Ukwa hawa male sae Ni mwe mwe katatae Ni mwe ka mshinga Ndi mwana wenu Ndi mwana wenu Ni mweka tata, ni mweka musunga, ni mweka lesa, ni mweka musunga, ni mweka. So why are these trees being cut down? You know, these living forests create communities for wildlife. They increase fishery yields. They're, they're nursery habitats. They, they, they provide places for these tiny fish to grow to avoid the bigger fish. They're sediment stabilizers. Uh, they prevent coastal erosion. And so I want to share a quick little story. About 40 miles south of my study area, there is a place called Sedwana Bay that I would frequently dive at. It's one of the best places in the world to dive. And right on the other side of the coast, there, there are these inlets. And inside these inlets, these forests exist, these mangrove forests exist. And when I left in 2016, there was still a forest there. And so when I went back, uh, I was going on a dive, and a local dive operator was telling me, oh, yeah, this entire area has been cut down and they've replaced it with mangrove, or banana trees, excuse me. And that, that really resonated in me because, you know, if, if, mangrove, if mangrove value was appreciated, you know, through their, through their carbon storage, then perhaps these trees wouldn't have been cut down. And so the entire area is managed by a local tribal council, and everyone listens to the tribal council. So what I went over to do was speak with the tribal council and talk to them about incorporating policies where we would bring blue carbon into the aspect. So how do you value the invaluable and how do you get an entire community to care? Conveying this message to Chief Tembe was really important and their value lies from the carbon that they're able to store. And when meeting with the, the tribal council, I, I sat in the room in the lobby for about two hours, and it was, it was really hot. And I saw, once, once I was able to meet, there were, there were five gentlemen there, and once I was able to meet, I got very, very scientific with it, and there was just sort of this like glossy look over everyone's head being like, what is this guy talking about? We know he used to live here, but we don't know what he's talking about. And then I said, but listen, we can, we can make money off of this. And Chief Tembe looks at me, he goes, oh, oh we can make money off of this. And I go, yes, and he goes, Gampela, which means really. And I'm like, yes, we just need to preserve more. We need to reforest, we need to plant more trees where trees didn't exist before. And that is where their existence, lie, their existence value lies. And that's, that really, really excited everyone on the council. And I also held workshops in the community as well because to get the information out that people should, should value these trees more, I, I went to the local education center and said, whoever wants to come learn about mangrove trees, please come and learn so, so that we all can stop cutting them down. And this information really, really helped because principals came to the workshop, educators came to the workshop, 
And these are the people who are well respected in the community and people who people listen to the, the educators and the principals. So conveying that message was very important. So when I conveyed the existence value uh, to the council, like I said, they were, they were very, very excited. Yet I had to tell them that the social cost of carbon is very dynamic. And so uh, setting up a system for payment for eco ecosystem services is, is what needs to be done. But we have to make sure that we have a non-dynamic uh, social cost of carbon. And so a voluntary market where people can go in and donate money to carbon projects like these, like this reforestation project and afforestation project uh, is you know, very important. People like, like you and I who think, oh, we may drive our car a little bit more than we should. Corporations who are, are, are big polluters can donate as well. And this voluntary market would, would really, really help out fund and, and fund other projects as well throughout the world. So this project couldn't have been completed without the, the help of these wonderful people, John O'Niles, Dr. Mark Jacobson, and Paula Escura, who uh, served on the committee, and also the wonderful MAS cohort, who uh, they were definitely emotional support because there were a lot of days in Eckert when it, <laughs> it was tough. And also our wonderful director, Samantha Murray, and Risa, wherever she went. Um, so thank you all. Any, oh, hey, it, any questions? <laughs> Thanks, Tilly. So I didn't know you went and did these workshops. It's so awesome. When you were there, it sounds like you know, the community initially, culturally, wasn't very receptive to the idea of restoring mangroves. Like, they're just trees. Who cares about them? So what garnished their interest, aside from you having the conversations with the politicians over there? Like, what actually brought in all of the educators that you were able to engage in the different community members? Thank you for that question, Crystal. And there's a one-word answer and that's money. <laughs> um, no, it was, it was really cool because I said, if we're able to bring extra money into uh, the community, we can fund different projects, like being able to get more educational materials for the schools throughout the area when there's sort of a lapse in funding, and also build like town halls and community centers, and that, like, that really, really sparked all of the interest. Um, I could share another quick story with you. The school that I used to work at, actually, we, we had our computers stolen. And they were in between uh, funding year. And so the payments for ecosystem services would help get more computers for the school that I, that I used to work at. So I was just wondering, how do you set up uh, these ecosystem services? Like, what is, what is the way and the capacity that you get these corporations or people to get involved and really drive forward uh, the investment towards the, the mangrove restoration? That's a wonderful question, Christy. Thank you. Um, basically, you, you would set up a fund and a nonprofit where there'd be third-party auditors who would go in and determine the area of uh, afforestation and restoration potential and go to the community and say, we have, we, there, there's X amount of space and you can potentially make X amount of dollars for this. And so it would it'd be through third party verification. Thank you all, no more questions. <laughs>